This past week, I had an opportunity to go with two of my grandboys to the mall. <clears throat> we went to Toys R Us. They had some gift cards that they had received over the Christmas holidays, and they wanted to cash them in. And uh, so when we got to Toys R Us, we looked around a little bit, and they had, a, of course, a limited amount of money they could spend, and they found some items that was under the amount that was on their cards. And one of the things that they got, Asa really wanted this, was a Netcha sketch. Remember the Asa sketch? There's a lot of old gray hairs in here in the building that's probably played with that sketch. That's been a toy that's been around for years. You know, it seems like there's all kinds of toys that are electronics, and they've got bells and whistles and lights and all kinds of things. But yet, Etch-A-Sketch still is one of the most sold toys on the market. And uh, the way it works is real simple. You sit down, you've got two knobs that you're able to control the vertical and the horizontal movement of the stylus. And you can draw pictures, or you can write with it, or you can create messages, or whatever you want to with it. But the wonderful thing about it is, whenever you get finished with it, or if you mess up, you can always pick it up, turn it upside down, and shake it, and start over. Well, we're kind of in the mode this morning, with the beginning of the year, as a starting over standpoint. Usually we see the holiday of... New Year's being a day in which we're going to start over. And your starting over may have begun earlier, uh, but today you're looking at or you have already began to work on new ideas, new concepts, new goals, new things that you want to do for the year. You may want to lose a few pounds. You may want to get into an exercise mode. Uh, you may be looking at strategic planning for businesses that this year you plan to accomplish this thing or that thing. And uh, the starting point is the beginning of the year. In businesses, usually we look at January 1 is when we're going to start over. It's like taking a great big etcher sketch, turning it over and shaking it, and then setting it down with a brand new platform before us that we can begin. And I applaud you. If you have got some goals in mind, we usually call these resolutions. But if you have some strategic plans this morning, I'm glad that you have them. But I also want to encourage you to include not only health goals and business goals, but also spiritual goals as well. This morning, I want us to go on a different kind of journey, a journey that 2014 is going to take us into looking at the inner man. If you will turn to Romans chapter 12 or chapter 2. Romans chapter 2 and I want to read just two verses of scripture that sets the tone for what we're looking at this morning, the inner life. Notice what Paul says beginning in verse 28. Romans chapter 2 verse 28. For he is not a Jew who is one outwardly nor is circumcision that which is the outward in the flesh. But he is a Jew, he is one inwardly, and circumcision is that which is of the heart by the spirit, not by the letter, and his praise is not from men, but from God. Now this morning you could substitute some words that would really help us to get the point. For instance, he could have said, for he who is not a Christian, who is one outwardly, nor is circumcision that which is outward in the flesh. But he is a Christian who is one inwardly, and circumcision is that which is of the heart. You see, we need to set goals, whatever the goals may be, to get healthier, to lose weight, to acquire more financial security, to do a better job with our children, maybe even to step, take steps in our future. But also there is an inward journey that we need to look at and to make sure that we are involving the whole person. You see, he is saying that we're more than just an outward shell. But we're much deeper than that. The, the inner life, whenever I talk about the inner life, and this is the important part of our lives, is the inner life. Because the inner life describes the habits that are affected by our heart. 
You see, our heart is going to guide us and we're going to react and we're going to do things according to what's going on inwardly, the heart. When we talk about the inner life, the inner life describes the belief behind the behavior. Why do we behave the way that we behave? Why do we do the things that we do? Well, it's because of the beliefs that we have. And if you want to modify the behavior, you modify the belief. And when we talk about the inner life, the inner life describes the desire behind our duties. You look at Christian living, is it a duty or is it a desire? Because you see, desires are very important. And sometimes we need to change our desires. We need to re-educate our hearts to desire and want those things that God wants us to have. Because God does not want us to be just some empty shell walking around with no reality on the inside. God wants us to be who we are all the way through to the core. It's not just a whitewash. It's not just outside. But it goes all the way to the core. And he wants us to be who we claim to be. He wants us to have this on the inside. Now, to do this, there's a couple of things that we've got to do on this journey. The first thing is we need to talk about the distractions that can cause the inner life problems. And then look at the disciplines that the inner life needs so that we can be that Christian that Paul was talking about when he made that statement that, you know, the child of God, he's not just outward, but he's inward as well. It's inward as well. When I think about distractions, there's two basic distractions that covers just about all of them. And uh, the first distraction that I like to describe is, and you know, a distraction is something that draws your attention away into a, uh, to a different object. For instance, you can be sitting in the auditorium and you can be listening to me or listen to someone teaching and uh, one of those red wasps comes flying by. Uh, what's going to happen? Well, you're going to quit thinking about whatever the speaker was talking about, and uh, you're going to start thinking about that red wasp, aren't you? So you see, sometimes physical changes can occur that can cause distraction. Sometimes it can be mental, mental changes as well. Someone can say something, and it clicks something in your mind, and uh, they're talking to you and ask you a question, and they look over at you, and you're a million miles away thinking about something else. You see, it is a distraction. It's something that gets you off, and you're looking at a different object. This time of year in sports, there's all kinds of coaches change that goes on in uh, ball teams, whether it be on the collegiate level or the uh, professional level. And one of the things that they try to do with teams is to quickly move with those changes so there will not be what are called locker room distractions. Locker room distractions is where the players are more concentrated on what's going on outside the locker room in the world than they are in what they need to be involved in and in getting ready for the game. Well, there can also be spiritual locker room distractions as well. And we have to be careful about allowing our minds to get distracted because a key word can trigger a thought or you can see the something and uh, it will take you uh, away from what you need to be thinking about. And life is like that. We so easily can get distracted and not be able to do what we want to do. Uh, here are a few of the distractions that can keep us from really going on this journey that I'm talking about, this spiritual journey. The first one I call frenzy. Frenzy. It's the idea of busyness. You know, you can get too busy. As a matter of fact, in the business world, they call this workaholics. You know, you have people who are so busy that they never really get to be involved in the important things of life. Some people can work so hard that they never, ever take a vacation. They never, ever stop to smell the physical success of the roses that are there. 
They are always involved in working and moving on to that next project and that next item and that next thing. And they're always saying to themselves that one of these days I'm going to slow down, but they don't ever slow down. Well, spiritually, the same thing can happen to us as well. We can get so busy that we fail to be what we ought to be for the Lord. I have known of people, whether they, some were ministers and some were elders, some were deacons, that have gotten into spiritual trouble. You know why? Because they were so busy doing the Lord's work that they forgot to develop themselves. You see, they got so distracted that they forgot about themselves. And they did not develop themselves. They were so busy with others that they forgot about me. And so it's important that we do not allow something like frenziness, busyness, get in the way because you can be too busy, too busy. All right, and then the second one that I want to mention is one called familiarity. Familiarity. That is, I become so familiar with something that it does not mean anything to me anymore. Over in 2 Timothy chapter 3 and verse 5, the Apostle Paul, writing to Timothy, tells him of people who were spiritually empty. They looked religious, but they were spiritually empty. Notice that he says in 2 Timothy 3 and verse 5, that they are holding to a form of godliness, although they have denied its power, avoid such men as these. He says, they hold a form of godliness, but they deny the power thereof. That is, they look good, they have the right appearances, but the problem is, on the inside, spiritually, they're empty. We can not only be busy, but we can also get too familiar. Let me show you over in Revelation chapter 3 that there were two congregations that familiarity got them spiritually. In chapter 3 of Revelation in verse 1, of course, John is writing to the church at Sardis. And he tells them, <clears throat> if you, uh, Revelation chapter 3, verse 1, to the angel of the church in Sardis write, he who has the seven spirits of God and the seven stars say this, I know your deeds that you have a name that you are alive. But now notice the last phrase. He says, I know your deeds and I know that you have a name that lives, but you are dead. Notice that you have a name that lives, but you are dead. What was wrong? Well, they had become so familiar with spiritual things that those spiritual things didn't affect them anymore. You know, I can come to church and I can get so familiar with reading God's Word and so familiar with prayer and so familiar with singing songs that I can get up and leave here and it didn't change me spiritually at all. I mean, I can look good, I can sing well, I can pray a beautiful prayer. I can read God's Word, but if I become so familiar with it, you know what happens? I become empty. And I just go through these things in rote repetition just over and over and over. And he says, you can have a name that lives, but spiritually, really, you're dead. In chapter 3, if you go on down to verse 17, as he addresses the church at Laodicea, notice that he says, Because you say that I am rich and have become wealthy, and I have need of nothing. Now the Lord says, let me show you the true reality. Let me hold up the mirror of my word to you so you can really see what you're really like. Because you say that you're rich and that you're wealthy, and that you don't need anything from anybody. And you do not know that you are wretched, and miserable, and poor, and blind, and naked. These are people who were struggling spiritually, but they could not detect the struggle that was there. It was an inside job. You see, I can get too busy... But also I can get too familiar as well. 
we sing these songs and we sing them. I can sing these songs and think about other things and not put a, bring them into my heart. It's not going to mean a thing to me. There's not going to be any power there at all. And uh, we must warn ourselves that uh, we're not just to play the Christian game outwardly, but we're to take these things to heart. And the reason is, and, uh, you know, I don't want to become so familiar with the outward tokens of my faith. You know, like singing and praying and studying God's Word and giving. I don't want to become so familiar with the tokens of my faith that they no longer draw me to God. You know, this morning, does our service draw you to God? Do you ever leave with an empty feeling? Well, you know what's going on? You're too familiar. You're too familiar. And you see, the journey that we need to take is a journey that whatever we do, it draws me to God. Because, you see, let me tell you something about 2014. There are going to come a moment this year when you're going to have to dredge up from within the reality of who you are to meet some situation. I don't know what that situation is going to be, but there's going to be a situation. There's going to be a moment when you're going to have to dredge up from inside you the reality of who you are. And you're going to have to face it. And you may have to face the fact that, you know, <laughs> there's nothing there. And you're going to go away with an empty feeling. You ever wonder why people's faith fails them? Because of what we're talking about right here. You see, they, they really don't have inside them. They are not. They're outwardly. They're not inwardly. And we are going to have to sometime look inside and see if there's something there so that we can say, I can stand on these things because they're in me. Now, as we think about the distractions, how do I overcome these distractions? Well, there's some disciplines. And you know, the word discipline is a word that we don't necessarily like. Uh, I like Tom Landry's uh, description of the job of a coach. You know, Tom Landry was the coach of the Dallas Cowboys for over 30 years. He had a very successful team. And he says now, when it comes to discipline, the job of the coach is to make men to do what they don't want to do in order for them to achieve what they wanted to achieve in the first place. In other words, sometimes we have to make ourselves do what we ought to do. I'm not always going to get up and want to live for the Lord. I'm not always going to wake up in the morning and have great faith. I'm not always going to wake up and want to read my Bible. But discipline says, I do it anyway. I do it anyway. Why? That's what discipline, the nature of discipline is to do what I don't want to do. I do it anyway. And through discipline comes success in life. And the Bible talks about discipline. Turn with me to 1 Timothy. 1 Timothy chapter 4. Again, as Paul is talking to this young preacher, Timothy, in verse 7 and 8 he says, But have nothing to do with worldly fables fit only for old women. On the other hand, discipline yourself for the purpose of godliness. For bodily exercise profiteth little. Bodily exercise profiteth little. Now, some of us, and I include myself, like to live by that motto right there, Steve. <laughs> it profits little. <laughs> now, he's going to show a contrast here because, you see, you may have the discipline to exercise. And that's vital. It's important. He says, but bodily exercise profiteth little. But godliness is profitable in the life that now is and the one that is to come. You know, it's really interesting, isn't it, that if you really think about it, exercise will help you. Uh, you remember Jack LaLanne? 
Uh, I, can, I can say one thing about him. When he was 80 years old, I saw that guy on TV, and I mean, his body was rock hard, and uh, he was doing exercises like he had been doing since I was a little boy back in the late 50s and early 60s, you know. And uh, then it wasn't, lo and behold, I, I heard that he had died. The only thing I can say about bodily exercise is Jack LaLanne died in shape. <laughs> Isn't that right? He died in shape. Bodily exercise profiteth little. The word exercise there comes from a Greek word, gnemu. And guess what word we get from it? Gymnasium. The place where we strengthen ourselves. Now he says, people see the advantage and the profit of exercising their bodies. But the exercise spiritually, but godliness is profitable for not only the life now, but the life which is to come as well. You see, he's talking of discipline. Discipline yourselves spiritually. In the mornings you may get up, well, I don't want to go walk, or I don't want to go exercise, but you do it anyway. Spiritually, you may wake up, you may not want to be kind today. You know, I don't feel good, my head hurts, and I'm going to be grouchy. Well, don't do that. Be kind anyway. I may be doubting God. I may be wondering, well, God, where are you? But I got to have faith anyway. You see, that's what spiritual discipline is. Spiritual discipline. You have to have it. Now, when it comes to spiritual discipline, you think about the two ways that we are distracted. When it comes to a frenzied life, what do we need to do? Well, one thing is slow down if you're real busy. Do you know over in the 46th Psalm in verse 10, the Bible says, be still and know that I am God. Be still and know that I am God. You can get too busy. There's a lot of things that you can do that we call multitasking. You know, I can pray and go down the road. I can put a, a CD uh, disc on and listen to the Bible uh, while I jog or while I walk. But you know, when it comes to really knowing God, I got to be still. I cannot multitask and know that there's a God. There requires a quiet time for me spiritually. And so he says, you got to do that. Number two, not only that, but you got to learn to pray. And you got to, whenever you start talking about prayer, you got to remember that prayer and waiting go hand in hand. Over in Hebrews chapter 11, <coughs> the Bible speaks of those people of the great roll call of faith that they never, ever saw the promise. They were waiting. They had to wait. And sometimes we don't realize that waiting is a part of what God wants us to do. God many times wants us to wait. And there's a reason is because waiting will develop your faith. You see, we look at it this way. Well, God promised it. I don't see it. So I don't have it. But God says, yeah, you have it whether you see it or not. And that's the whole point that he makes in Hebrews 11, verse 39 and 40, is that these people lived their entire life waiting for God to give the promise, but yet they never did receive it. And he says, now, this is an object lesson for us spiritually. Sometimes God wants us to wait. Waiting strengthens our faith. You see, faith, waiting gives us an opportunity to sift our motives. You know, you, you've been praying for something. You've been wanting something to happen, and it hadn't happened. You haven't realized it yet. Uh, well, you begin to think about that. And rather than saying, well, God, why not? Look, look at your motives. Look at your motives. It, it helps to sift our motives while we wait. It helps to remove the impurities and the foreign material that is there. 
uh, years ago we took a, a, a trip with the, the children out west. And one of the things that I wanted to do when I got out there was to pan for gold. And that, I really got a kick out of doing that. You know, you scoop up some dirt and you got this water and you're stirring, you know, and you get out all the rocks. And you finally get down to where you just got this little bit of silt. And you just keep adding water and, and keep washing and keep washing and adding water and keep washing and keep washing. You see, that's the waiting part right there. And what am I doing? The gold's there. I just got to sift through all of the debris to get to it. You see, that's what waiting does. Waiting helps me to sift through the motives. It helps me to sift through the debris to get to the gold of God. And, and waiting is God's way of bringing us around to his point of view. Waiting will, will help us to get to his point of view. Be still. Wait and know that I am God. And then, not only do we need to wait, but also when we come to this concept of familiarity, becoming familiar, over in 1 Thessalonians chapter 2. Turn there with me. 1 Thessalonians chapter 2. Look in verse 13. Notice what he says about God's word. 1 Thessalonians 2 verse 13. For this reason, we also constantly thank God that when you received the word of God, which you heard from us, you accepted it not as the word of men, but for what it really is, the word of God, which also performs its work in you who believe. Now he tells us here, in 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, that we need to receive God's Word. And there's a couple of things that he says we need to do. Basically four things. I want to give them to you very quickly in our lesson. Be Number one, he says you need to accept God's Word as God's Word. That means accept it as the truth. Today we live in a, a time whenever, you know, Hal's got his truth and Steve's got his truth and uh, Richard's got his truth, and I've got my truth, and our truths may never meet. But he says, receive God's word as the truth. His word is the truth. And if we want to overcome being familiar with God's word, too familiar with it, then we accept it as the word of God. And then number two, you've got to have the right attitude. You've got to anticipate it anticipate his word and then not only anticipate it but you have got to appreciate it for what it is God's word is just not somebody's good idea it's not somebody's opinion it is the way life is and so we have to accept it we have to anticipate it we have to appreciate it. And then finally, we have to apply it. Apply it to our lives. You apply God's word. And let me tell you, if you are really going to go on this journey that I'm talking about this morning, you have got to get into God's word and do these four things. Now, as we close out our lesson this morning, let's get back to the Etch-A-Sketch for just a moment. This time of year is a year time of starting over. Whenever I was small, and I think you can still buy these little pads, it was a piece of plastic, kind of a translucent piece of plastic that was on this little pad and had a little plastic stylus. You remember those, Steve? And you could write on them and draw on them, and then all you had to do was pick up that little sheet of plastic and pull it up, and it would erase everything that was there. Did you know the blood of Jesus... Is just like that. It will erase everything that was there. This morning, if you want to begin that journey, begin it right. Begin it with the application of the blood of Jesus into your life. Why don't you begin this journey this morning? Put your Lord on in baptism. Resolve that you're going to live for him. If you're sub to your invitation, come. All together we stand and sing.